Uh, we're going to move on swiftly uh, to our next speaker. That's uh, Dr. Ronan Glynn, uh, who is a good friend of mine. He qualified first as a physiotherapist in 2002 and then as a medical doctor in 2007. Uh, he worked um, in uh, the lab and completed his PhD in surgical oncology in 2012 in NUI Galway. Shortly after this, he embarked on a career in ENT surgery and then pivoted into a career in public health medicine becoming the Deputy Chief Medical Officer in 2018, and as we all know, he has acted up as the Chief Medical Officer both this year and last. Uh, Ronan, it's our pleasure to welcome you to Sligo to present to us, and we're all very much looking forward to hearing what uh, you have to say. Thanks very much, John. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Great, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so hopefully that's sharing okay there. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to everyone today. And just listening to Professor Leach there, I think um, a lot of a lot of what I'm going to say, certainly in terms in terms of the main themes, uh, chime very closely with the with the previous uh, speakers. So so uh, let let's look at that in a bit more detail as we go through here. Obviously, as, as everyone listening to this knows, we faced one of the greatest health care challenges. Uh, in history and certainly in the last uh, century over the past 20 months. And today I want to just talk about that from a number of perspectives. I want to give a little bit of the context that we faced back in early 2020, talk about some of the challenges that, that we faced then in particular, but obviously since then and ongoing, uh, how we've tried to respond to those challenges and then the outcomes so far and the lessons so far and again, I'd certainly echo Professor Leach uh, when it comes to, to saying that this is so far, this pandemic is still going on. Uh, we, we should not be speaking about it in past tense. Uh, and as we've seen overnight with, with news around this uh, new variant, uh, the challenges continue to, to emerge, unfortunately. Uh, so just a little bit of the context, as, as people will remember, first cases of this were first reported in China at the end of 2019. And very rapidly over the period of a short number of weeks, uh, the world came to realize that this was unlike anything the vast majority of people living had ever dealt with before. Uh, by the end of January, there were cases uh, all across the world and the public health, uh, WHO uh, declared a public health emergency of international concern at the end of that month. I think from my own perspective, it was the, the first clusters of cases in, in Lombardy and Italy and, and the, the reports that cases were, were emerging in healthcare workers, in patients in hospitals, uh, uh, clusters of cases with no links to China uh, and, and seeing how cases rapidly spread across those regions in Italy when, when things really started to hit home at a personal level that this was this was going to be something that was, was serious for us and with us for, for the foreseeable future. Obviously, between 22nd and 29th of February, we saw cases arising all across Europe, and, and, and we, we reported our own first case here on February the 29th. By March the 11th, uh, it was across 114 countries, over 4,000 deaths, and the WHO declared a, a global pandemic. And unfortunately, by April the 1st that year, we, we'd seen over a million cases. Deaths were doubling week on week, and we'd had 50,000 deaths alone at, at, at that stage. So in Ireland, obviously, we, we were monitoring this really closely from early in January. The first meeting of the NEFA took place on the 27th. And then obviously, as I said, we had our first case on the 29th of February. By the, by the 11th of March, we had 43 cases and our first death. And I'm sure most people will remember the, uh, the then Taoiseach's speech from Washington on the 12th of March, uh, in which he announced the closure of our schools and creches and, and, and restrictions on mass gatherings and other measures. Things then rapidly deteriorated over, over those following weeks, and we had our, we had our measures, uh, full, full stay at home, full lockdown measures by the end of that month with, over, with almost 3,500 cases and, and 85 deaths. So that was a very brief context to, to what we faced early, early in 2020. And I suppose within all that, um, and you know, when you're when you're preparing a presentation like this, you can you can you can approach it from a whole range of different uh, angles. But the one I wanted to talk about really was uh, our, our relationship with the public and the challenges around that. And so 
uh, as as January, February, March 2020 unfolded, it was a time of massive uncertainty. As Professor Leach said earlier, uh, there was so much that we didn't know then, and indeed we still don't know now about the virus, how it transmits, uh, who it affects, who's most vulnerable. And of course, again, relevant to, to, to what we're hearing today, how it mutates and how it will change over time. Uh, it was a time when massive decisions had to be made on the basis of uncertainty. Uh, and we knew at the time that the consequences of getting those decisions wrong were potentially enormous. Uh, for both ourselves and for the public at large, there were masses of information coming at us. And a lot of that was misinformation. The public were trying to get uh, make sense of fragmented, confusing, often contradictory information. We had to make decisions based on imperfect information. There was a balance of judgment in, in the majority of what we had to do. And, and indeed, that still, that still pertains today. And yet, despite all of that, we were asking individuals in society to come forward and do something for the collective good. To do. Again, Professor Leach spoke about the individual patient interaction. Here we were asking society, we were asking individuals to look at what they could do for everybody else. Um, and so to do that, we needed solidarity and we needed people to understand why we were asking them to do what we were asking them to do. Everyone did face the same pandemic. But we were, we've always been conscious as well that going into this pandemic, people's risk tolerance, people's economic circumstances, people's values, people's family circumstances, they're all different. And therefore each individual's experience of this pandemic was very different from one from another. And so all of this then <clears throat> was coming on the back of a decade where globally there was a crisis in trust, a crisis in uh, trust in our organizations and in, in, in many parts of our uh, society and so from that perspective i suppose the, the theme of this is, and, and my firm belief is that the single most important attribute that we've had to nurture throughout the pandemic has been public trust so what i want to do is talk about some of the, some of the challenges that were the obstacles we faced in in trying to build and maintain that trust uh, and to overcome mistrust um, and i want to talk about four challenges in particular today so the first of these is, is, is the issue of false dichotomies. And I think a, a major issue for us in our response over the past 18 months or two years, and it continues, is that um, so many issues have been framed as black and white. It's either, it's either A or B, when in reality, the vast majority of decisions that have had to be made, the vast majority of the evidence that we look at in the world that we've inhabited over the last two years has been somewhere in the spectrum of gray. And the problem with framing things as black or white, black or white from our perspective and trying to communicate with the public is that it shuts down and polarizes debates and it, it leaves no room for a middle ground so that, for example, some say schools are safe or schools are dangerous. Of course, it's somewhere in the middle. There's oversimplification of complex issues like mode of transmission of the virus. We tend to ignore and obscure nuance. And we ignore that there's a spectrum of risk. Uh, and and so, so when we say that outdoors is much safer, it's that it's much safer. It's not that it's completely safe. And so we need people to do all of the other things that we still ask them to do, like keep distance, for example. The second major challenge then is the search for the illusory panacea. So it's no surprise that given the, the massive impact that this pandemic has had on people's lives, their livelihoods, uh, their family circumstances, uh, that people are desperate for a panacea. Two years into this, I'm desperate for a panacea. We all want the game changer. We all want the silver bullet. The reality, unfortunately, is that it simply doesn't exist. And instead, what we've tried to do throughout is to communicate that what we need is for people to layer up the protective measures, that there's no one measure that's going to get us through and out of this pandemic. Yes, vaccines are vital. Yes, they're our most important tool. But we need all of the other tools in our armory uh, to see us through this and to keep us safe. And that's both at an individual and collective level. The third channel ch challenge then in, in uh, maintaining trust has been the impact of multiple voices. Uh, and I suppose I want to be careful that this, this isn't misconstrued um, because it, it's important to point out that with something as impactful as this pandemic has been on society, a variety of views is vital. Debate is very healthy. We need societal discussion on what we value. We need different perspectives on, on how we respond to this pandemic. And of course, in terms of the scientific process, debate is at the core of that. Knowledge changes over time. It's never certain. It's always partial. 
Uh, and there has to be debate and challenge as to what the evidence says at a point in time. And that's how science works. And I think an important message that we need to try and communicate better to the public is that you can have two eminently qualified scientists or doctors they can both look at the exact same piece of evidence and come to entirely different conclusions about what that evidence is telling them to do in policy terms. Um, but all of that aside and all of that accepted that debate is important, the reality is that a challenge for us through the pandemic has been that with, with every day multiple different commentators on multiple different aspects of, of the response, uh, the delineation between expertise and opinion uh, between evidence and judgment has become blurred at times. And, and we know that the public are keen to follow the science. We know they want to follow the science. They've been, the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing most of the time, but at times they have gotten confused through all of the messaging because they're not quite sure which science it is where they're, they're expected to follow. And then the final of the four challenges to, to building and maintaining trust has been the reality that this is the first pandemic to be mediated through the prism of um, the internet and social media. And the reality is you can find what you want to find on the internet. And, and it, it, appeals to, to, it appeals to our natural tendency to, 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 to seek out beliefs that conform with our pre-existing beliefs. And I think it's put very well by one commentator who talks about social media and the community on social media being like a warm blanket versus the cold reality of the challenging perspectives that we have to deal with every day in the real world. And so it's no surprise then that social media and the internet has, has, uh, has fostered misinformation and disinformation uh, and all the challenges that that's brought in relation to a whole range of aspects of the pandemic, um, most notably, I suppose, vaccine hesitancy. So how did we overcome these challenges? Um, and I, again, this is uh, just, a sample of, 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 or I suppose, a high level overview of the themes I think that have been important in overcoming this. Firstly, given the extent to which there was so much uncertainty at the start of the pandemic, and, and that remains, it was vital that we put in place structures that, that brought together as much expertise, as much leadership, as much know-how as possible early on. And we did that through the mechanism of the National Public Health Emergency Team. And it, had, it in itself had 30, 40, 50 people at various times feeding into it directly. And on top of that, it had 10, 11 different subgroups at the earlier stages of the pandemic. To date, it's met over 90 times. There's been over a thousand papers reviewed by, by the central team, over 90 sets of minutes and letters. Um, so, so there's an enormous volume of, of material has gone in and been reviewed by that team that's informed the recommendations that come out of it. And I suppose a key part of, of ensuring that those recommendations are, are appropriate to the challenges that we faced uh, is, the, is, is the variety of expertises that have fed into those subgroups and fed into the NEFIT itself. And uh, I, I know there's, a, there's an easy trope that's thrown out there that NEFIT is simply uh, a group of uh, uh, mandarins in the Department of Health who are focused on policy. The reality is that all of these specialties and expertises on the screen that you see here, and many more, in fact, this is just a sample, uh, have fed in and continue to feed into the expert advisory group, to the uh, epidemiological modeling group, to the behavioral advisory subgroup, all of which feeds into the NEFIT itself and informs uh, the recommendations that we make to government. And again, this is just a, 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 an example of the extent of the evidence. So there's been over two and a half thousand different research papers, research bulletins, evidence updates, guidelines developed uh, in Ireland as part of our response to date. So the second part of it then in, in, in terms of responding to the challenges that we face. So we had, to, we had to put in place structures to assess quickly the evidence that was coming at us. But then of course you have to respond to that evidence. And so we've tried to do that throughout uh, quickly uh, and adhering to, 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 to the, the knowledge that we have at a point in time. And again, to echo Professor Leach earlier, uh, you, you try to tell the truth, but the truth is what you know to be at a point in time, and that evolves over time. So in, in terms of how we try to respond rapidly, obviously people are very familiar with the, the additional population level measures. Uh, we've also had to review and update and change our policies across a whole range of issues like testing, like mask wearing, our views on symptomatic and asymptomatic spread, our travel policy, duration of immunity, the issue of vaccine bonus. And I suppose just looking specifically at the vaccination program and all of the work that NIAC has done in particular around 
prioritization of particular groups, dosing intervals and how they've changed over time, the need to pause the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, last March, uh, the extension of the program to adolescents, um, the change to heterologous from homologous vaccine schedules, the role of booster vaccines, and of course, uh, the, the, the possible extension to children in the weeks ahead following the review by the EMA uh, this week. The third part then, so you have, to, you have to have mechanisms in place to assess the evidence, you have to be able to respond to the evidence, and then again to echo Professor Leach's experience in Scotland, you've got to communicate and be consistent and be transparent in your communications. And communications has been a central tool of the public health response to date. And early on, we realized that evidence and data wasn't going to be enough in our communication. You've got to harness the power of stories and you've got to explain to people why you're recommending what you're recommending. We've always sought to communicate that the evidence and advice that we give and that we look at is not the sole basis for decision making by government. And government has to integrate a whole range of other inputs into the decision making process. We've tried to be clear at all times on our core priorities. So clearly our first priority has been and remains to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Secondly, we want to protect our healthcare system. And thirdly, we've sought to protect our education system and childcare services to the greatest extent possible. I'm sure there are many out there who would disagree with this, but genuinely we have tried to promote solidarity. We've tried to promote the message that most people are doing most of the right things most of the time. And we can see that in the data. Without that, this virus, even today, would be, would, be, would be leaving us in a much worse position than we are. We've sought to avoid stigmatization or blame. We've tried to be transparent. We've, we've reported deaths uh, uh, and our reporting approach to deaths, for example, has been far wider uh, in how we, how we report deaths than many other countries internationally. And that left us open to very significant criticisms around our early experience of this pandemic. We've tried to acknowledge concerns of people as legitimate, and I suppose the best example of that is in relation to the vaccination program. We know that 7% of people have yet to get vaccinated, 7% of adults. We also know that the vast majority of those people are not resolutely anti-vaccine. They've got legitimate concerns, and our appeal to those people is to come forward and talk to your local doctor, pharmacist, your midwife, if you're pregnant, your obstetrician, you, you may decide at the end of those conversations that you still don't want to get vaccinated and that's your personal decision and if, if that's how you choose to go that's fair enough but at least come forward and have the conversations we've tried to be honest about the challenges we've faced we haven't had all the answers all of the time and we've had to respond on the hoof at times to to, to the changing situation but we've tried to communicate and be honest about that and i think more than anything else we've tried to be willing and try to communicate uncertainty uh, we haven't had all the answers. No one has all the answers. There, anyone that tells you they know for certain where this is going, indeed, anyone who tells you that they know today where this is going over the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, that needs to be treated with a very significant pinch of salt. So the ways we communicate it, again, like Scotland, we tried to identify or have identifiable figures early on who would front up uh, and communicate the key messages. Uh, we were doing daily press conferences for the vast majority of, of the first half of, of 2020, uh, followed by twice weekly after that. And we've stepped those back to a certain extent at this point and communicating through, through uh, other forms, whether it's social media uh, and through mass media. We've obviously had to, 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 to communicate at all times with our medical system uh, and with the political system. Uh, and although you might not see it, there's very specific communication also done with, with uh, particular groups such as younger people and, and uh, minority groups. So what have the outcomes of this been to date? Um, just in broad terms, we, we, we have by and large maintained trust uh, with the public um, uh, and you know, that's thanks to, to the work of people within the health system getting us through this and helping us through this and communicating the same message, messages that we've been trying to communicate. Uh, but thankfully, that level of trust in turn has, has resulted in people buying into the measures and by and large, and again, I'd, I'd very significantly caveat this slide because as I said earlier, we're not through this um, and we're certainly not through the current wave that, that, that we're facing at the moment, but to date, our, our experience in terms of mortality uh, compared to many other countries has been a favorable one. Um, but as I said, uh, there's a long way to go to go in relation to that just yet. 
but perhaps the best the best the best evidence of the trust that's been generated uh, has been in relation to our vaccination program and the fact that 93 94 percent of, of of those eligible have come forward and got vaccinated uh, to date and, and that in that is, is in itself a large part of the reason why we're not seeing the very significant levels of mortality uh, that unfortunately some other European member states are seeing uh, even as we sit here today. So they're, they're the high level outcomes. Again, I'm very reticent about, about sharing too many lessons at this point because I think we, could, we continue to learn every single day uh, with, with the challenges this pandemic is throwing at us. Um, but I suppose there are, there are a few key, key messages uh, and I have two slides here. So the first is around the general process. And I think if I've learned anything, it's that public trust has to be the cornerstone of what we do in our response to this pandemic, but it needs to also be the cornerstone for anything we try to communicate in scientific and medical practice. From a personal perspective, I think a, a, a phrase that's chimed with me over the past two years is, is this idea of confidence, humility. So uh, there's times when, when you don't know what the next right thing to do is, but you need to have faith that, that you, can find, you can find your path uh, and, and don't lose confidence in yourself. You, you've got to keep going. Uh, uh, collaborate with others uh, and you will find uh, the best way forward. As part of that though, you need to accept that change is a strength and not a weakness and that it's at the heart of the scientific process. And ultimately as scientists, as clinicians, uh, the medical community more broadly, we've got to foster moving forward. And I hope this is the lesson that comes out of this pandemic. We need to foster a culture which acknowledges uncertainty. Uh, too, too often, I think in, in, in our discourse, we try to portray uh, 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 certainty where it simply doesn't exist and I think uh, there should be plenty of time for reflection on that point in the aftermath of, of, of what we're dealing with at the moment. From the perspective of the public I think we need to acknowledge that they can manage middle ground and complexity and shades of grey. We don't need to, to simplify everything into black and white and they can handle uncertainty uh, 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 but, but, but all sides in a debate need to communicate that uncertainty. There are known unknowns and unknown un unknowns, uh, but too often we've, we've, we've seen people uh, speak with certainty about various aspects of this pandemic and it, it clouds uh, the honest debate that we need to have on so many, so many elements. And then finally, in this era, era of social media, we need to accept that the public are now active participants, both at, at, a, at a macro level in the response to the pandemic but I think there's a lesson there also in relation to healthcare at the individual level. Uh, I think a clear message is that numbers are not enough. It is the narrative that matters. We need to put stories around. We need to explain to people why we're asking them to do what we ask them to do. As a community of, sci of scientists and doctors, I think we need to acknowledge that it's not just about what we do day to day, one to one with individuals. We need to, to stand up for and create and disseminate accurate information. We need to stand up against misinformation. And we need as a society to continue to promote health literacy so that the public themselves have the tools to, to interrogate all of, the, all of the information that's coming at them. And then just one more slide on lessons. And I know I won't have enough time to do this slide justice, but I think a key lesson out of the pandemic for the health system is that the health system is only as good as the, the staff that we have working within it. Uh, and without you and without all of the work that the healthcare staff across the system in the community and acute services have done over the past two years, we, we would be at nothing. Uh, and I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to, to all of the staff who are listening in today, because um, I can only imagine, I mean, we've all experienced the pandemic in different ways, but I can only imagine what it's been like for so many people working on the front line, trying to manage family life. Uh, and, and their professional uh, their professional responsibilities over the past two years. Uh, and the only other point I'd make in relation to this slide is that one of the false dichotomies that became apparent to me earlier early on in this pandemic was the false dichotomy of uh, it's it's the economy or it's public health. They're completely intertwined in any healthy society. And so moving forward out of this pandemic, I hope that we have an increased, uh, focus on, on equity, on the social determinants of health, of ensuring a healthy population and acknowledging that that's a really crucial and important part uh, of ensuring a healthy, vibrant uh, society and e a vibrant economic society. So that's the end of my uh, formal presentation, but I know that people are probably interested in where we are 
in relation to the pandemic itself in Ireland. So uh, at day 636 from our, our first case in Ireland, I just give a couple of quick slides uh, just, just to bring people up to speed at where we are. Unfortunately, we're not in a good place. Uh, we're reporting about four and a half thousand cases a day on average over the past uh, uh, week. The one bright spot, I suppose, is that the number of patients in hospital has, has dropped from almost 650 just a few days ago down to 571. And we've seen a decrease as well in the number of people in ICU. Uh, but I would caution that 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 can change again very quickly. Uh, and I would caution against anyone taking too much uh, hope from that at this point. Um, as you can see here on this slide, the last three weeks, we have been three of the top five uh, weeks in terms of total weekly cases since the commencement of the pandemic. And we can see a real takeoff in cases there uh, from, from the end of October, the first week of November. Every country in the country uh, is seeing very, very high levels of this disease, with almost all counties having a 14-day incidence of, in excess of 1,000 per 100,000 population. And as I said, unfortunately, that's translated into over 70 admissions per day on average to hospital at the moment. Uh, and as we sit here today, I think it's about 118 people in ICU this morning. So we're certainly not out of this. We have very significant challenges ahead uh, in the short term. And I know people will be aware of, of the uh, news coming out about the new variant. And we'll, we'll have to assess that and update people on that in, in the hours and days ahead. Um, but again, I just want to thank everybody for all you've done over the past uh, two years. And, and again, just to say to ask people to stick with this and to keep doing uh, all of the basic things that you've been doing to keep yourselves and your family safe. Thanks very much, John. Thank you very much, Ronan. I, I know you have a talk uh, to go to at four o'clock on, on the new variant. Do you have time for a few questions? Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what has been your greatest professional challenge over the last 20 months? Um, <laughs> I think uh, Jason Leach said something which chimed with me. He spoke about imposter syndrome and, uh, you know, at times wondering how he ended up in the, in, in the rooms that he ended up in. And I think that that resonates with me in that uh, we're trained as doctors to to get to a point where you, you finish your professional training uh, and then you're in a specialty and you're seeing the same things more or less day after day. So you go into work each day and you have a fairly high degree of certainty about what you're going to see, how you're going to manage it uh, and, and the conditions and challenges that you're going to face. The reality over the past two years for us is that almost every day has been characterized by uncertainty. We don't know what's coming next. Uh, and it's, I think the challenge for us has been to, to be decisive whilst acknowledging that uncertainty. And I think the lesson for me anyway out of that is, is that the way you overcome uncertainty is, first of all, to acknowledge that it's there, that you're not the only one that's struggling with it. Um, I think we have a perception in medicine that those that get to the top of medicine and the, the eminent professor of this or doctor that have all the answers. None of us have all the answers. We're all struggling every day in our professional or personal lives with, with uncertainties. So we need to acknowledge those uncertainties, to collaborate with people, reach out, ask questions, don't be afraid to take advice from a wide spectrum of people. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, I think it's, it's, it's not to be afraid to be, to be humble uh, and to, if you can accept that others may have, may have the answers and reach out to them, invariably you will come up with a better solution than you would have come up with yourself in the first place. So I think that, that's been the challenge and the lesson. Great, thank you. Is, are there any questions uh, from the floor? Yes. So, so just to uh, to to uh, say that again, we, uh, just a question on in relation to the the vaccine hesitancy and in particular the hesitancy for taking the booster. Um, any any thoughts on that, Ronan? Um, well, I think the first the first part of that is I'd like to see the definitive data that 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 assures me that there is that level of hesitancy. 
I know, for example, that with healthcare workers, many would have had multiple different opportunities to get the booster. And so I think in the early weeks of this, there may have been appointments that weren't being fulfilled because people couldn't cancel, easily cancel second or third appointments that they were being given. Uh, I'm not convinced at this point that, that we will see significant hesitancy when it comes to boosting. Uh, and maybe that's a challenge for us in the weeks ahead. There's no doubt that, that our own data and international data is demonstrating that boosters have, have, a, have a remarkable impact.